Uh, hey guys, before we start this week's episode, we just wanted to uh, kind of reflect on a real serious thing that happened this week. Um, yeah, we lost a friend this week. We lost somebody yeah. that we all look to in times of stress and in times of weirdness to provide us with little nuggets of information to brighten our days. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's been many, many news articles that come out about this, this, this thing really like kind of carried our Instagram story for a long time. If you look at the mass live article from last year, there's a really adorable picture of Caitlin from table talk. And I, we look like, uh, real estate agents back to back in it. It's kind of ridiculous, but we talked about it on our first live show. It, we, this has been something that has been part of seltzer time pretty much throughout the entire existence. We just wanted to say, uh, rest in peace to the table talk Twitter account. Thank you for all that you have done. Uh, yeah, I mean, thank you for the pineapple facts. Thank you for the smiles and yeah. for the shower. Was it shower thoughts or something? Like a shower thing that they did. Like, we barely knew you, but you will be greatly missed. Shout out, uh, not to be that guy, but um, I just want to give a huge shout out to both Mass Live, who picked it up, and also Worcester Magazine, who picked it up later in the day. And, uh, you know, you guys couldn't even mention the fact that we're the ones who kind of brought it to life. It's okay. We don't care. But We know. We, we know. <laughs> don't worry. We get it. You guys, you guys need to get your own on this one. We get yeah, it. We don't, we don't need any more spotlight. But um, but for real though, uh, kudos to whoever was running that account. You guys made things really fun for a really long time, um, and I thought it was pretty cool that their uh, final tweet was a link to a Black Lives Matter yeah. organization. So shout out to those guys for doing everything the right way, never being offensive, and for being awesome. So Table Talk Twitter, we miss you so much. We miss you already. Cool. All right. Enjoy our episode. Bye. What's up, you guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Seltzer Time Podcast. It's your boy, Ricky, a.k.a. Dick Chuck, a.k.a. the man behind the can at Seltzer Time Official. Here, as always, with my conversation accomplice, I don't know how to talk, Travis. What is cracking, Fizzle Fiends? Welcome back to the, another episode of the Seltzer Time Podcast. And as always, we are so glad you're with us. I think we're probably reaching the end of these uh, Zoom calls. We're starting to get to that point where we're considering hanging out in the same room again. Uh-oh. It's a nice idea, but uh, who knows? <laughs> who knows yeah. what tomorrow's going to bring? We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I, uh, it's not looking good for all the states that opened already. <laughs> They're all having massive spikes in cases, which is not surprising. So I'm sure we'll be back in the situation a lot sooner than we thought. It's also not looking good for people going to uh, the Trump rallies that have to sign the basically yeah. sign a uh, waiver saying that they're not going to sue if they get corona. My favorite thing ever is um, the arena only holds like nineteen thousand nine hundred and forty people. Yet he okay. was tweeting out uh, three hundred thousand people have done tickets, five hundred thousand, and then this morning I think it was yesterday or today he tweeted out that over a million people have requested tickets, and it's like first of all. Whoever is like promoting this uh, event is definitely trying to overbook it because you won't be hold 90,000 people. Also, somebody found a Craigslist. That's the one I saw for actors. Yep. It's like, well, all right, man. Like, yeah. Sick. Keep living in your fantasy land. Seriously. Meanwhile, the whole thing about Melania came up that she renegotiated the prenup right before she moved into the White House. Like that whole, she was taking care of Baron. Really, she yeah. was negotiating a prenup. <laughs> oh, really? So anyway, but this is not a political podcast. This is two <laughs> balls talking about fart jokes. So, yeah, uh, but fuck Trump though. <laughs> fuck Trump. <laughs>
hope you had a terrible birthday. Yo, all right, last thing. I find this so fucking fascinating, but there is a lot of people that think that he has dementia. I saw that. If you look at like clinical things that are, what is it? Uh, symptoms of dementia. He kind yeah. of scary. Yeah, it's not, it's not good, but like, sorry, man, you're garbage. Gary. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I don't feel sorry for him. No, no, no. Get yeah. out of the office. Yeah, he sucks. Anyway, so last week on the show, <laughs> we had Woodrow Adams Jr. of 508 Forever Young. It was awesome to talk to him. Um, it was really cool learning about all the stuff he's been doing in the city. Yeah. So you really got to be paying attention, more attention to. Yeah, I'm excited to, uh, to help as much as we possibly can with the back t- backpack drive and literally everything that he's a part of is just moving things forward in the city. It's, it's really impressive. That's serious, dude. I mean, the dude had his birthday. His birthday was the same day the episode released. So happy birthday, Woodrow, if you're listening. Happy birthday. Um, but he put up a fundraiser for 508 Forever Young. In a few days, he's already raised over six grand, which is sure. just absolutely fantastic. Sick. So if anybody has some, some you know, money to spare and they want to support a good cause in the local community, 508foreveryoung.com. Check out Woodrow. The, he's not just talking the talk he's walking the walk yeah exactly so it's all that um so this week on the show we figured we'd go a little a little more relaxed we've been talking about some heavy stuff past few weeks and with summer right around the corner basically here uh we keep talking about songs of the summer and good music so ricky had the idea to talk about some of our most influential albums some of the stuff that really impacted us but before we get there you know what we have to do. Hey, Ricky, how was your week, buddy? Uh, um, my week was cool. It was good. Um, nothing super crazy. We, what did I, I don't even know what I did last week, to be honest with you. Uh, I think, I feel like the week was like pretty, pretty whatever. Um, obviously there's a lot going on in the world. So I was pretty glued to Twitter as normal. And then the NHL announced that they're coming back next month. I think games, either games or training camp, I think games actually are slated to kick off like the 31st or 30th or something of July. Are they so, just through the summer? Yeah, they're going to, so the season's going to restart in July, like end of July. Um, they're going to be in two cities. Vegas is one of them. And then they haven't announced the other because it's most likely going to be a Canadian city. Makes sense. Which they'll do like all the West, West Co- or the uh, Western Conference playoffs will happen in Vegas. All those teams will be quarantined to the city, quarantined to their hotel. They're not going to be like allowed to go out and, and you know, experience Vegas. They're going to have to literally stay like in this hotel. Um, practice facilities, all that stuff will be closed to the public. It'll just be, you know, they'll have their own like little world. And then for Eastern Conference, they're going to do most likely a Canadian city. Um, I would be shocked if it wasn't like an Ottawa or a Toronto or a Montreal only because they haven't announced anything yet. And I know it's like a lot of the major like East coast cities um, were like wildly impacted by coronavirus. So a lot of um, the like, cities already have the infrastructure to support yeah, I mean, that many. Exactly. Big. It's, it also comes to the point where it's like, where's the ice going to, you know, stay as cold as possible <laughs> through the late summer. It's already like, kind of a Vegas. yeah, I know that's, that's insane. But that, that arena is brand new. I'm just so their kidding. ice system. No, I know, but it, like on, on paper, it looks completely insane, but that, that building's brand new and that, their ice machine or ice uh, sheet and stuff are all, all state of the art. They'll be fine. Plus it's also hot there all year long. Right. Boston or New York where in the summer, the ice is garbage, even though it's inside, but there it's just too hot and muggy here. The climate doesn't work for it. So uh, it sounds like it's going to be a Canadian city. They're waiting to find out what their um, like mandatory quarantine when they get into the country is going to be. That's kind of what's holding everything up. But it sounds like they're going to announce that sometime, sometime probably this week. So I got that going on. Uh, today is the nine-year anniversary of the Boston Bruins winning the Stanley Cup. So 
I've just kind of been nonstop stoked on that all day. Because every time I, like, go on Twitter, so many that too. Yeah, yeah, I just, like, keep getting, like, goosebumps and stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God, what's that? But, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so I've been, like, really – I'm just, like, very hockey-focused right now. Um, so I did that. We had uh, the virtual uh, big climb on Saturday morning. So yeah. shout-out to everybody who donated – um, I haven't actually gone back and looked to see like what has gone on for donations the last couple of days, but Naomi said there was a crap ton that came in after we posted stuff. So nice big thank you to everybody. Yeah. Like huge thank you to everybody who donated. That was awesome. It's a massive, 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 massive help. Um, my calves still hurt from going up all the stairs so many times. So that abs that are hurting the worst, my calves. Yeah. My feet are really tired. Like my feet are exhausted. Even now we're like, you know, two days removed basically, but we both woke up this morning and like trying to get out of bed was a little painful. So it's the quads that I notice. Like if we do hills, if Sarah and I walk a bunch of hills, it's like right underneath, basically like the part of my leg right underneath my butt. If you're yeah. going down towards my legs, my feet. Um, but the calves, that's an interesting thing. Yeah, dude, they were killing me today. Yesterday they were sore. Today was way worse. Um, yeah, yeah, it's weird, but it is what it is. And then, so I did that Saturday morning, and then I went to the Say Her Name protest over at East Park, which was awesome. A whole bunch of people were there. It was great. It was kind of interesting looking out. So I got, I was up like pretty close, like with a bunch of people. And looking out, you could see everybody was staying like as socially distant as possible. That park is also really, really, really big. So it, was, it didn't look like there was as many people as there were at the last, like I went to the first protest, I missed the second one. So it didn't look like there was that many people. Um, Joe Kennedy was there though. He was like right behind us. It was kind of interesting. Yeah, kind of cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. And then as we all went to go march in the street, you realized how many people were actually there. And it was, it was a really, really good turnout. Um, so that was cool. Uh, big shout out to all of the, shouldn't say all of, cause I know not everybody was in char- a part of this, but, um, a big F you to the guy that was standing in front of vintage grill, recording everybody, flipping us off and yelling at us and a bigger F you to the old, older gentleman who got up from his chair while sitting outside and hit us with like a double thumbs down. I was just like, dude, come on, man. Like <laughs> it was ridiculous. He stood so, up and gave two thumbs down as people yeah. walked by. Yeah, it was so weird. So, yeah, those guys sucked. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so then after that, I shot over to Dead Horse and got some tacos. I was trying I to get a saw that. Dude, I had to. I was, first of all, I was, like, super hungry. Because, like, I climbed stairs all morning. I came home and, like, changed and then went to the protest. I, like, didn't eat really at all. So I was on my way home, like, I got to eat. Stopped at Dead Horse to grab tacos. I love those guys. Everything they do is great. Want to try to show us some support. I'm not even kidding you. I had what I'm pretty sure is the best meal I've ever had in the city of Worcester. Whoa. Yeah, I got the two uh, Carninas tacos, which were ridiculous. Um, an order of the, uh, the turnips, which were unbelievably good. And then I had two mojitos because, you know, you're not going not to not have mojitos. But yeah, it was awesome. They so like I'm not into like going to a restaurant right now, even sitting outside. I'll continue to get takeout. I'm all about it. Hanging out at a restaurant just isn't my thing. I also know that like there's no way I'm gonna be able to go to a place and not get mad at somebody else who's sitting there. Because I know people are garbage and they're gonna be even more garbage right now. Oh hell and yeah. I'll end up by- getting in a fight. Yeah, we drove, I'm not going to name names, but we drove by a place that's open right now for outside service. And we look and their fucking tent has flaps. So like you could see in the front, but the whole side and back is all flapped in and there's plenty of tables there and they're really not sitting that far apart. And I didn't see that many masks when I drove by. And I'm just like, fuck all that. No, thank you. Yeah, it's not, not for me right now, but. I thought I noticed you sitting at a table at Dead Horse. (laughs) So yeah, so I was gonna get the tacos to go, but the way they had it set up, you order, you order your food and like any drinks you want through the windows of of Dead Horse. Behind you is the food truck, which is where they're making all the food. So then like you order, Julia like 
sends the order over or whatever. Sean makes your drinks right there. And they had two tables. They had a table set up uh, over near like the door to go into Dead Horse. They had a table set up there. And then they had another table on the side of the building in the parking lot. So there's only two tables. So there's really not that many people can be there. You kind of, you're better off like getting your food and leaving. So the only reason why I stayed was because this table was empty and there was nobody else around me. It wasn't like I wasn't under a tent. It wasn't even near another person. Respect. So I sat there and crushed some tacos. It was so I'm like honestly very excited to see what their menu looks like this weekend because there's a really good chance I'm probably going to grab something again. It was so, so, so good. I'm pumped to hear that the taco truck is up and running. Like, yeah. When if that if it, that stays that way, they're gonna crush. It was the best, easily the best tacos I've ever had in the city. And I'm not even kidding you. Probably the best meal I've ever had in the city of Worcester. It was unbelievably good. That's impressive. So that was uh that was it. it they just kind of chilled. Time. What's up? Sorry. Yeah, see, that's the beauty of when we get to the point where we're not doing this fucking thing over Zoom. We can actually have a conversation and not realize we're talking over each other. Dead Horse <laughs> is still my favorite meal in the city, so it doesn't surprise me that the tacos are that good. Yeah, not a crust. How was your week? What's up? My week was great, man. I, uh, so I basically played catch-up all week because the week before I was so just unfocused and concentrating on social media and reading about everything that was happening and then reading about everything that I should have read about years ago and whatever yeah feel that we're talking about listening to last week's episode so this week i've been playing catch up um and with the weather turning something that's always bothered me is that i people always complain about how hard it was to find the murals using the map on powwow worcester's website and i understood the problem but i couldn't figure out a solution i would try something and it like we did google maps and again, you could kind of get everything, but it's still not 100% fantastic. So over the like last weekend, I got one of those like a, epiphany moments where I'm like, I know what I can do. And I Googled a, a plugin, plugged in this little extra thing for the website. And now on this map, all 120 murals that are here in the city, um, you can click on the pin. So zoom in, find the neighborhood, click on the pin, click on the artist's name and it brings up an entire page that shows a photo of the mural, a photo of a progress shot, a photo of the artist if we have one, and then a map, a zoomed in map, one icon that shows you what building and where it's located in the city. Oh, cool. So in theory, using these new resources, we're gonna really get loud this summer and, and because we're gonna have to have a different type of summer we're not going to be able to have the festival like we've had in the past. We're not having our big year five celebration yet. But we do want people to go out and appreciate the stuff that's already out there. And like, I would, I'd be willing to bet that not many people have seen every single mural. That's no, I still have one. So <laughs> yeah, I know I haven't, and I'm yeah. on goddamn board. So <laughs> no, I did see. Uh, I did get to see some murals that I think I told, I talked about this on the show a couple weeks ago. I got to see some murals from the first year that I'd only heard about and nobody would tell me where they were. And through some very odd happenstance, I found myself in a situation where I got to go up and see them. And like, I think I'm, I think I'm about ready to post them because I'm probably far enough away that I won't get anybody in trouble. Yeah. Uh, but there is, there's, there's some really cool. There's a high five from Fanicapan. He's the guy that did the balloon smiley face. He's oh, yeah. Balloon five up at the top of a building. So it's a high five. Oh, cool. I love it. So I took photos because I want to use that for year five promo for Papa. But oh, that's the okay. point. Point is, we overhauled the website and we're continuing to put up all the resources. Um, the only things that don't have maps are the things that are either were temporary like some of Belinsky stuff yeah. uh, or the murals that have been gone over. Cool. And yeah. And then what else? Uh, oh my God. The big thing, the big thing that I did last week is a couple weeks ago, I had scheduled my haircut with Josh over at Heartland. And on, little did I know that the day of my haircut would also be the day that new tradition opened back up and decided to start serving coffee again. There you go. So I got a double whammy. I got to see all those beautiful gentlemen uh, 
<laughs> I got myself a delicious cup of coffee. I sat outside with Joe Gonzalez Dufresne. We just stood us outside, man, sat there and drank a coffee. It felt so humanizing. It was wonderful. Yeah. And I, just got this I got a I got a haircut from Josh like two weeks ago. The first week he was open, um, I got in on Friday. It's a little like, I haven't showered today yet, so it's a little like not that in the zone. <laughs> but it looked great. It still looks when I take a shower. It's um, that feeling of not having that huge head of hair. Yeah, no, it's been, it's the first like normal thing that I did was get that haircut. And then the only thing I really needed after that was for new tradition. Because so when I went, they weren't open yet. They opened... I don't know, like a week later, I think. Yeah. 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 Thursday. So I went, I ordered coffee. Like they opened at nine. I was there at like nine twenty. got to see Joe, which is great. Haven't seen him at all. So it was nice to like, nice to see him walk in, see a very familiar face. And then, uh, yeah, hung out there for a little bit. Well, for like a couple minutes while I picked up my coffee (laughs) and then I left. But same. I mean, outside, we hung outside and stood far away from the entrance sat on those rocks no i felt bad for joe because he said that when he first turned on the it was the first time they're accepting online orders so when he first turned on the thing it was like he's like holy shit i haven't done this in months yep yeah he was saying the same thing he was like what time did you go here so i went down there for 10 so i must i I missed you 25 minutes probably (laughs) yeah just missed you Oh, damn. We'll have, we'll have plenty of time now that we have a little oh, bit of time before the next quarantine. Yeah, yeah true, true. <laughs> I got to stock up on uh, Anchorhead. I bought a thing, a narwhal, and it's already gone. Really? Oh, yeah, I crushed it. I got, uh, so like, I, when quarantine first happened, I was still going through a bag from them. Everything hit. They didn't. They weren't open, and I was like, "I'm not gonna order it from Cal, from Seattle, like whatever." So I bought a bag of Armino from Crust. Then I think I bought another bag of Armino. Then I got a bag of James coffee from California. Then I got a bag of Armino, which I'm almost done with now. But now new traditions open, so I'm sure the next thing I get will be. Uh, I got a I got a couple bags from my buddies down in Middletown, Connecticut, Purgatory Roasters, a couple weeks ago. Oh, cool. from Rockwell. That was, that was like a nice treat. Other than that, I haven't really been going out, so I was drinking this San Francisco coffee that I got from the grocery store. Uh, it's still whole bean, but yeah, yeah, it's not roasted by people I know, and that bothered me. Yeah. So it's nice to yeah. have that back. I feel you. Yeah, I was very excited to be back. So. Ready to do some quarantine coffee soon. <laughs> uh. Awesome. Well, that about covers it, man. Uh, So I think we can rip into this stuff. So Ricky hit me up last night with an idea. Here, take it away. What's up, guys? Um, Yeah, so we were kind of kicking around, like, you know, what are we going to do for the show? Like, we didn't have a guest set up for this week. I probably mentioned a couple weeks ago that, like, during all of this, I've kind of re-fallen in love with music. I still try to get through, like, all the podcasts that I like to listen to. It's become not a chore, but like, it's become a little, like, it's difficult. Uh, but I've listened to way more music recently than I have in a very long time. Um, we were just kind of kicking around ideas and I was like, well, what if we did an episode where we each picked five records? I love doing stuff like this because like the five records I have written down, none of these artists are even in like my top five favorite artists ever. One of them might be, it might be the closest, but like, and I've always been like that. And, and like, some of these records are like absolute classics, but some of them aren't. <laughs> so I'm kind of saying. Yeah, I have, I have an eclectic mix. I have one or two that people are going to be like, really? And then one or two that are kind of obvious. Yeah, I mean, I guess mine... One of them's like a little, well, two of them are kind of obvious for me. I think three of them will be rather surprising. Um, But yeah, it was, uh, it was really easy to come up with my top five because I've like kind of honed that in over the last, I don't know, 10 plus years. I've really like, I've figured out which records I personally think are like just unbelievably good 
front to back. Um, I don't think any of these records have my favorite song ever on them. Like, it's just, I don't even know. Like, I just, I love, love, love these records so much. So yeah, Travis was down to do it. Figured we'd uh, do a show talking about some records and yeah, see what happens. <laughs> I took the approach that like, these records, yeah, they're not necessarily the best records, but these are the records that, that either influenced me, they hold like a really special place in my heart where I can listen to these cover to cover and they're going to take me somewhere. Yeah, exactly. 100%. All right. So your idea, how about you start us off, my dude? All right. So, okay, should we start with like number five first and work our way to number one? So truthfully, I didn't do mine in any like particular order other than kind of like sequentially how I discovered them. Like, oh, okay. I went, so like, my first one is the very first album I've ever had. And... Oh, okay. All right, well, all right, let's do this. Since yours aren't in like, like a particular order, I'm not going to put mine in order. I'm just going to bounce around. But I'm going to... Well, I guess I already said mine were in order. Then do yours okay. in order. Whatever. I'm going to do mine in order, but I'm going to start from five down to one. Perfect. Cool. So... Number five um, is Maroon 5's Songs About Jane. It's okay. My, it's, it's been a record that, like, I love that. I don't love that band. I shouldn't say I love them because I don't love that band. I love that record. When that record came out, I was in high school. It came out in 2002. So I was in, what, ninth grade? Yeah, I was in ninth grade. Uh, I just remember, like, loving Harder to Breathe. That was the first single off of it. Just a like oh my god i thought that was the, the sickest thing ever it was kind of a weird time because in high school all i cared about was like pop punk music and like the beastie boys so <laughs> to like a like pop band was a little like i was kind of the only one in my friend group that liked that band um i might even still be the only one in my friend group that liked that band but uh so yes yeah, so i like i love that record i thought it was incredible front to back i was obsessed with the fact that like when they would tour they would do a lot of covers like stevie wonder covers prince the beatles like that was kind of their thing like they were this pop band but they they clearly pulled their influences from you know their parents music yeah. um which i thought was awesome it was really 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 interesting and also those songs even to this day don't sound like any other band i've ever heard like i wish that Every like I'll never forget the first time I ever heard uh, like twenty four karat gold by twenty four karat magic or whatever by Bruno Mars. I posted that on my Instagram. Like you can even like scroll way 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 back when that song first came out. I posted it and I was like, I wish every song sounded like this. I just I love I love all of that stuff. This Moon Five record does not sound like that, but in my opinion, this is what I want every band to sound like. Like, there's guitar solos. There's just an insanely tight rhythm section. I love Adam Levine's voice. The songs are, like, like some of them are, like, dirty and sexy and super poppy. And there's, like, just such a cool rock element to it. And, like, they weren't trying to be anything. They were just a band. Like, I, f I love that so much. So, yeah, I just kind of, like, completely fell in love with that band. I have plans to get some of the record cover like tattooed on me like okay i love that record i put it on all the time just if i'm ever like driving and i'm like i just want to hear like something like so familiar there's songs on there that remind me of the winter there's songs on there that remind me of like the hottest days in the world because they sound like you're like it sounds like it's hot and muggy i don't know that record is just fucking beautiful it's so good you really but, yeah. I don't I love, know if you can do that deep dive on any of these. Like, they all held special places, but I haven't, like, ripped them apart to that extent. That's fascinating. Uh, so, yeah, my, uh, my first one out the gate is Maroon 5 songs about Jane. To this day, I've never listened to a full Maroon 5 record after that. I bought two, or about one of them? I think I bought the second one that they came out with, and it has great songs on it. Like, that record, and I, I actually do like that record more now than I did when it came out. Because it, it was a progression, but it wasn't, there was a lot of filler. There were like three songs on the second record that I really liked that I'm like, dude, if you guys 
just put those out, it would have been awesome. And I think they would have grown into what I wanted them to be as a band. And they didn't do that. And they've, they've gone in a completely different direction now. I've seen them live twice. I saw them live when this record came out, um, which is actually, it's funny we're recording this right now because of the stub stories that I'm recording later. One of the shows is the, the first time I saw Maroon 5. They played like a Kiss 108 show. Then they played like second. Nice. <laughs> And, like, that's why I was excited to be there, but, like, it was weird. But um, you, you have to watch sub stories. But then I didn't see them again for, like, almost 15 years. My brother um, got me tickets when they played the DCU Center a couple years ago. We went to that, and it was cool. And they played, like, four songs off of songs about James. They played a lot of new stuff. And, like, it just – it was a little not really my jam. Okay. But, yeah. I mean, so that first record, you could put it on any time. And yeah. Oh, yeah. I would put that record up against. It's really hard for that record not to be like a number one or two for me. I think the only reason it's a number five is because I'm pretty much over this, like that, like this love, like that song. I. It's like probably my least. Well, is it that two, album? It's that album. All okay. their like early big songs came off of that one record. That song is cool. I think that I like the music to it. I don't really it's probably my second least favorite song uh she will be loved is my least favorite song on that record i hate that song so much. but it was i don't hate it it's really good it's just like that's the one that was my least favorite and that was probably the second biggest those are the two biggest songs on that record but they're so they're still so good i even don't even like the songs i love those songs like that's how much i love that record that's how i know it's like that good to me respect so, yeah so my first on the list is the very first album I ever got my hands on. I was, so this is probably talking 1995. I'm maybe 10 at the point. And my babysitter, uh, my parents worked all summer and my brother, my sister and I had a babysitter, uh, Heather. Heather came over with a cassette tape of this music that I've never heard before. It was a band called Green Day and the album was Dookie. Okay. And she played Dookie. And I remember, I still to this day remember the first time I heard Basket Case and just absolutely like, what the fuck is this music? Like, what is this? How do you, how do they play so fast? Like, and again, compared to the things I listen to now, it's not really even that quick, but I was listening to Bruce Springsteen and fucking yeah. Club, Club and Sticks and shit my mom had. I love like, Club. Oh yeah, don't get me wrong. All that shit is great. I, but it's, it's absolutely no Green Day Dookie. And then, again, 10-year-old Travis hearing this language used, um, I, I waste all my time, can I waste some of yours? Or like, yeah. oh my God, that album is so fucking good. And I got her, I got her to um, make me a tape, make me a copy of a tape. So at this point, I was like learning how to, how to record off the radio. Yeah. I, killed one of my mixes one of my dope mixes that was probably awful with like <laughs> half recorded songs um because you couldn't you'd have to sit there anyway it doesn't matter i remember killed one of those just to put in green day dookie and then i played that tape so many times that i actually wore the tape out and it wouldn't really? it wouldn't play anymore oh, oh god just like back to front to back to front to back to front mm -hmm. that record uh has one of the cool so burnout is the first song on that record and I still think that that's like one of the top probably three coolest opening songs ever. Just to like, bah, 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 like that little drum thing. Yeah. Blows my mind. Every time I hear it, I'm like, this is so sick. It gets what your a cool way. Yeah. It, it demands your attention off the, off the freaking initial beats. And then you're just, you're there. Yeah. I love Welcome, that. Welcome to paradise. And like, oh, and then having like, being able to be that young and like have hearing somebody's opinion change of a place just by spending time there being like, Oh my God, my opinion can change and that's okay. Oh my God. Yeah. It, it was fucking cool. Yeah. That record's amazing. I mean, it's not on my list, but okay. So again, like, like we said, like our lists are like our most important records. Respect. If I was to make a list of what I think are the best records of all time, I would put that one. If not top five, definitely top ten. But I would probably put that top five. Well, we'll see how this episode goes and see if people want that list later. Yeah, right? We could do it. <laughs> All right, my dude. Hit us with number four. All right. So number four is somehow the only hip-hop record 
that I have in this list. Um, Jay Z's The Black Album. Oof. So came out, came out in 2003. Uh, I'm, I've always been a huge Jay Z fan, even when I didn't really listen to that much hip hop. I always, always, always listened to Jay Z. Just he's the greatest ever. Um, so the Black Album was supposed to be his last album before he retired. I still have this CD in our office room. It's so I don't know if you remember the cover of that record. It was like all black. Oh yeah. And then it was like Jay Z, but it was like blacked out. Yeah. So all I really read was like Jay Z, the black album, which I think was in gray. So it was super dark. But then you open it, the CD, the original pressing of the CD is on a black CD. Oh really? Yeah, like you like you take it out and flip it over, and it's not that normal like mirror type in, or like you know how like every CD is like a mirror on the back. Right. This is literally like it's black. Like I'll post like a PlayStation album or a PlayStation game. Exactly. Yeah. Same. Same thing. So I thought that was like the coolest thing ever. Um, the way that that record starts with like his mom talking. All the singles off of that record were unbelievably good. Just. I can't, that's the, I love hip hop so much, but I'm not really a fan of hip hop records. Okay. Because I don't like a lot of like skits and sometimes I feel like a lot of them are pretty like stacked with filler. Like there's like obviously like some of the best songs ever, but then you're going to get a bunch of songs that like literally nobody uses every night. They're all, people just skip over all of them. This record, I don't skip any single song. I think every single song is amazing. Um, and then, I mean, it has public service announcement on it, which is the coolest song ever. I think that is the coolest song. Myself. My name is, oh. It's just like unbelievably epic. At, yeah, know, dude. Play it at freaking Bruins games, like when they come on the ice, all that stuff. Every time I've seen Jay-Z, that's always my favorite part. Like, just what a record. It's unreal that he, that was supposed to be his, like, his final record was that. That was it. He wasn't going to come back. Um, he did. <laughs> yeah. I but, knew a little bit about Jay-Z at that point. Like, I'd heard him from the radio. I thought his songs were okay. Um, and even when the Black Album dropped, I didn't really... I, again, I knew a couple of the songs. But it wasn't until Danger Mouse's Grey Album, where oh, yeah. Jay-Z's Black and Made with Beats from the Beatles' White Album, that I even learned how fucking fantastic that Black Album was to begin with. Yes. Yeah, so listening to the Gray album, I actually rediscovered the Black album and went back, and now I can appreciate that on its own. Oh, that's cool. It's a little so they, different way to get there, but I'm with you. The thing with the Black album that I thought was really, really cool is they re released it like maybe a year later. Um, it was still all black, but it came in like a clear red packaging. It was like a clear, like red film packaging over it, and it was a cappella. So uh, instead of releasing uh, the with just the beats so you could go and like remix it and do it yourself they released it with just his vocals and like i've listened to that a million times where i'm like oh my and like i know most of the words that record anyway but hearing just him like with nothing else was so cool because you also realize like that record is that's his that in my opinion his absolute best record he was at the peak of his career he was already too cool for everybody else he was already so much better than anybody else. He, there weren't, even the singles off of that record weren't really like traditional radio singles, especially for 2003. Like, they just, it just showed how much of a game changer he was and doing the 99 problems where like, you know, the second verse, like it's him and he's also the cop and like, it's just so good. There's so many behind the scenes, like documentary style videos on YouTube especially based around that record between like him and like Rick Rubin produced if not well he didn't produce the whole record because Kanye did some stuff on it, but and the Neptunes but he uh Rick Rubin produced 99 Problems and there's a video of him and Dre, uh, him and Jay talking about like like Jay's like all right play it back I'm gonna do the cop part and he's like what <laughs> and he goes in and just does it and, like he doesn't write stuff down either he just does it all like it's just it's the best I can't get over how good that record is it's impressive yeah. Well, I uh, I have a couple hip hop albums, but this one is the I guess hip hop. 
it, you'll see it walks that line it's 1996 i'm 11 12 years old and tv is in my like i usually wake up and watch music videos at this point so i was hey, like, <laughs> learning about it yeah exactly it was fun uh, it was weird um and i can remember the first time i heard dan and dan and dan and dan. no nope that's the wrong one fuck me i was listening to that yesterday <laughs> me anyway uh rage against the scene empire album with bulls on parade was i remember seeing for, uh, i remember seeing bulls on parade for the first time on mtv and it's so visually striking that like i needed to know what this band was it's i've never heard a song like that up to that point again yeah not many people were doing what tom and those dudes were doing merging hip hop and then like this really eclectic guitar use and then Tom Morello again using all types of improvised instruments a screwdriver some other random things that he's screwing around with his board and then Zach De La Roca is amazing even at that point he wasn't truly as like I would argue Zach is a better rapper now he has a lot more practice his word choice is far more diverse like killing in the name of there's like 30 words in that entire song yeah they're all powerful they're all fucking yeah. great but there's just not much there but yeah. like you listen to the tracks that he's doing with run the jewels now you listen to the stuff far more thoughtful and really working the words around and the metaphors and shit all that being said empire with the beautiful artwork on the front of which I, up until now i didn't realize how cool it was there was a video released um two weeks ago that went around the internet of Zach back then talking about it and how the boy was supposed to look like he's both proud and scared and he oh it's fantastic you gotta go find that I can't do it justice um but that band really turned me kind of like into hip-hop like yeah. oh my god this, the way they're saying these words is so fantastic and I love that they're rhyming and they're fast and they're they have double meaning and so um I actually <laughs> Rage Against the Machine, People of the Sun off that same album was the first song that I ever sang to a audience of people. I was oh, really? a rap rock band called Tripset. We were <laughs> we were lots of different names. Scared uh slow children at play at one point. Anyway, uh we were playing like a beach house. There's maybe 30 kids, and I rapped People of the Sun to poorly to a group yeah. of 30 of my peers and got them to applaud. And like, that's what turned on music to me and making music and wanting to pursue that life. That's so sick. So that, that album will forever hold a special heart place in my heart. Hell yeah. There you go. It's great against machine. Yeah. And then one last little thing. I love the posts that were going around last week that uh, somebody was like, screw you, Tom Morello, uh, keep politics out of your music. I liked you. And then somebody was like, what do you, what, what machine do you think they were raging against? The dishwasher? Yeah. It made me laugh real hard. I saw a thing that was like, you know, in that same vein where it was like, oh yeah, all these people, all these conservatives are complaining that Rage Against the Machine got uh, political. And they're like, when you were younger listening to them, when they were saying, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, did you think they were talking to their moms? Like, <laughs> Yeah, I saw that one too. That made me laugh real hard. Some of the most like conservative, right, not to get political, but like some of the most like conservative, like Republican people that I'm friends with, um, were some of the biggest Rage Against the Machine fans when we were younger. And I've it's taken everything in me not to like text them and be like, so do you still listen to Rage Against the Machine and Anti Flag? Because they pretty much were singing about everything that you back right now. But I have not done that. It's some of those that work forces are the same that burn crosses. Yeah, literally saying back then that the cops are the KKK. Yeah, heavy, heavy stuff for La, uh, you know, middle school Ricky to be like singing on the bus. Yeah, some of those but that work forces are the same that burn crosses. Okay, make sure. So, so good. So, shout out Rage. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> my third favorite record of all time uh, came out in 1977. It's Me Loves Bad Out of Hell. <laughs> Hell yeah. Dude, that record is so much better than anything else. Like, nobody does music like that. He So, like, the Me Loves thing was kind of interesting to me, too, as, like, a little kid. 
so that was that record is also like one of my mom's favorite records so that was on all the time but my mom like kind of only liked the singles like i don't think i ever listened to any song off that record that wasn't a single until probably like 11 years ago so growing up i that album cover is super iconic it's got the devil on a motorcycle like doing a yeah, wheelie definitely. it's just it's unbelievably everything about that record is epic the sounds on it are epic the just the lyrics on it are insanely epic this guy oh, his name last name's like bernstein or something so meatloaf kind of had that same like elton john aspect where there was another guy who wrote all the lyrics okay meatloaf performed them because nobody could perform better than him like he had he was like a trained opera singer so his voice is just unbelievably good he didn't look like a rock star in in the 70s they were all like coked out and skinny and sexy as hell and then you've got this like bigger dude this meat sweating ball. everywhere and like yeah his name's meatloaf like Our he meatloaf. just he like sings like an opera singer but it's just like it's pa- that whole record is just so powerful um and the songs are amazing the ballads are just beautiful some of the like most amazingly written songs i've ever heard in my life then you've got some of the coolest songs ever like but bad out of hell for instance i love that song they're just like it it that record plays like you're listening to like a musical but you're not i was like gonna the say whole it's thing, very emphatic it is it's super emphatic and it like it tells a story but it doesn't really go together like i just i, I love that record so much there's like some of the coolest piano riffs I've ever heard are in that record. And some of the coolest guitar riffs are in that record. Some of the best like one liners are in that record. And then again, I kind of fell like in love with that record, like 11, 12 years ago. Um, I was probably like 20, right around, right around me being like 20. Uh, I got to go see Meatloaf and he was, it was awesome. It was like going to see Meatloaf is weird because you're, you're going to watch kind of like a character caricature of a person. Like you're not, it's not like a real thing. You know what I mean? Like you're just going to see this like epic performance. You're not going to see like a cool show, if that makes sense. I see what you're saying. So like seeing him live was awesome. I'm glad I did it, but I would never do it again. Um, Especially now he's just like, it's kind of played out, but that record's perfect as a as a, an early 20 year old listening to paradise by the dashboard light and understanding what those lyrics are about and then getting to like the famous like baseball right announcement <laughs> that happened in that song and realizing that like that's them trying to like fuck in a car and thinking back to like literally one of my earliest memories as a human being is me and my brother as little tiny kids just running around the living room table as fast as we could while that song was on during that part. And I was like, dude, I bet you my mom thought that was like the funniest thing ever. Like these kids have no idea what this is about. Right. And we were just, I just remember oh, like, baseball. Yeah. Probably wearing like footy pajamas, just, just running like hell around the thing while this dude's like using the greatest metaphor ever for sex. Like it was just, I don't know. I love that record so much. It's, I think it's cooler now than it was when it came out. It's so sick. You want to come up? Sorry, I'm getting joined by a small furry creature. Come on. You're good. Come on, Our baby. small furry creatures, I think, are, are with Naomi working. Oh, you're so dumb. You're so dumb. Oh, what's up? Hello. <laughs> this is your big break. Um, that is, yeah. Uh, I can't say I was ever a huge Meatloaf fan, but I know those songs. We've all heard those songs. The song is epic. The whole, everything about that record is epic. I love listening. If you go back and listen to, there was a show on, uh, I think it was on like VH1, called like Ultimate Albums. And they did, all of them are interesting. I could watch that on, I could watch that on albums I don't even like. But like the one about Bad Out of Hell, I've probably seen like, no lie, like 40 times. Um, I, I watched it it was on, we would record it. Like me and my dad have watched it a bunch together. Like I've watched it on YouTube. I love, love, love that. So there's like parts in that record where it sounds like a motorcycle, yep. but it's actually a guitar. 
it's like the way that they do it was like playing and turning it down and turning it up and i was just like you hear all this crazy stuff there's those early meatloaf music videos there's a woman who does like all the female parts who would tour with them and would be in the music videos and she was like this like beautiful skinny woman turns out she's not even the one that sang the on the record it was like a different person it was just like there's so much there's More. so much that record it it's unreal but, uh, that's awesome dude yeah i may have to go back and listen to that one just to dip back into it i've never really listened to it with uh that type of mentality it's epic or that type of perspective um so kind of like your third album, I missed the release of my third favorite album, but it wasn't by that much. It was, and it was, I was alive. It came out in 2001, but I wasn't much of a hip hop head at that point. And then I got into hardcore music and I got into the band Vengeance Over Victory, the one that I toured with for a while. And our guitar player, uh, Ivan, the kid that came on the show and played as, um, he's doing the very vibe and he's also the organism he was a humongous hip hop head and he was like following Def Jux at this point. Def Jux is where LP and Aesop Rock got their start. And I'm talking about the second Aesop Rock because he showed me um, Labor Days, which is Aesop's, it's his second album technically, um, but it's probably one of his most well-known. And the, the song specifically is Daylight. And Aesop Rock Daylight is so well-structured, it, <laughs> I'm thinking about it, it's giving me goosebumps because I can, I can listen to that song right now, still pick out something new that I haven't really like fully wrapped my brain around. Um, and like the way he crafts sentences, the way he crafts his parallels, it's just, it's fantastic. And then I was angry in college and <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing to admit, but my, my understanding of the roles between men and women were just terrible. I was, I was learning about all this shit. And he has a line that says, life's not a bitch. It's a beautiful woman. You only call her a bitch because she won't let you get that pussy. Maybe she didn't feel y'all shared any similar interest. Or maybe you're just an asshole who couldn't sweet talk a princess. And oh. that line hit me at a, at a very malleable point in my life where it just changed my perspective. Like I, I, I heard it, I sat there, I thought about it and you're like, fuck, I'm the asshole. I've been doing horrible, fuck that. Yeah. And I'm not saying Aesop Brock is the reason that I'm a nice person, but he definitely like partly unlocked the door of like, yo, here's a whole other way to think about this shit. That's awesome. Yeah. And then the other, I mean, the other songs on there are, are fantastic. Lucy's on there. Lucy's... Another song that, if you actually listen to it, she's she's a, it's all about this girl that just spends her whole life drawing and how I never had a dream in my life because a dream is something you want to do and never pursue. I knew what I wanted to do since day one, so I basically ah, fuck I fucked it up. But anyway, it's just fantastic. I can't suggest that I can't endorse that album enough. That is absolutely on my like favorite albums of all time. Okay, off to you to listen. Aesop Rock. So if you don't know Aesop, it's, again, I, I know I've talked about this. He's touted as, like, if you compare word use out of all prominent MCs right out, his, like, the different words he uses, his, his vocabulary outranks every other artist out there. Like, really? doubles or triples. I'll find the graph and I'll send it to you. That's but so sick. Who, like, literally spelled out all their lyrics and his is like, <clears throat> and everybody else is down here. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I've never listened. I've literally never listened to him. At least I don't think so. I'm. Um. If if people are wanting to get into him, "None Shall Pass" is um probably my favorite album by him because it's his best constructed. But it doesn't like so. "None Shall Pass." Somebody actually took apart the words in that song and like showed what the meaning of what his words are, and like it's intense. I didn't even hear all the shit that this dude was pulling apart in these things. Really? Yeah. That video is fantastic. It's like 15 minutes long. I'll, okay. I'll, that'll be what I'll send you. Send it over. Word. That's what I got for three. Hell yeah. So, number two. Um, there's also a, like a record that like I knew 
the singles off of, but I never went back to listen to. I didn't, I, I wouldn't have appreciated it until now. Um, but in excess kick came out in 1987 year I was born. Um, I think it came out in June, if I remember correctly. I've done a lot of, I love that record. I don't love that band at all. I wish that band was still alive because, or I wish I was old enough to go see that band in 87 because like they went from, they're from Australia and they went from being like this big band there to like, not even as big as they were here, but like they were, they were a bigger band there. Then they came here, their first couple records like didn't do anything. The one just before kick had a song that was kind of big. Um, and then they released kick, which is just so effing good. Like it's very much an eighties record. It's very polished. It's, there's a lot of synth on there, but like, it's just unbelievably good. Like the guitar on it, everything's really cool. There's not a lot of like guitar solos. I'm not a huge solo guy. I don't really care. Um, but I like the like, like just everything about that record is perfect. Oh yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Like the, the lyrics are great. I really, again, wish I was able to see that band then because I, like I would rather see them over Led Zeppelin just because of like, I'm sure of how cool that show was. I'm not, I'm not like a huge like Led Zeppelin guy anyway, but <laughs> they're great. Led Zeppelin dude. I mean, if I can get like some LSD and go see it, I mean, what, uh, no, I, I mean, I'm with you in excess. They had that sound. Yeah. Eighties. They had that very eighties. They had a lot yeah. of synth. Um, yeah. Super eighties, super polished. But there's something about that record that's just amazing. Every single song is awesome. Um, even the ballad, the ballad was, was a huge, 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 huge song, Never Tear Us Apart, which on the new Run the Jewels, they actually do sample that song towards the end. I forget really? the name of the song, but I'll tell you after I'll look it up. But it's, it is the beginning of the NXS song. They sampled that keyboard. That's cool. And then there's a saxophone solo, and they broke that down and used that in there too. But um. Yeah, I'm, it's just one of the coolest records ever. Every song is awesome. Every song is super catchy. Every song is rock and roll as hell. Their lead singer, they were the perfect band too. Like everybody was really good at their instrument and their lead singer had an unreal voice, was super, super, super talented and was like wildly good looking. So like girls lost their minds for him. And like, they were just, they were the coolest. I, that record cycle is the only time I would have wanted to see them. But I, I love that record so much. I can put it on anytime and just be the happiest person. I don't think it's the name of a song off that album. Never Tear Us Apart was their biggest one. Devil Inside was pretty big. Um, I'm sure I've heard these songs. I just... New I, Sensation I, was huge. New Sensation. Yeah, again, I know I know you these know, songs. Yeah, you would know. I mean, you'd at least know f- four of the songs on this record. And you might even Sing know the more chorus. It was a massive, massive, massive record, but I wasn't born yet, so. <laughs> I was two. Yeah. I actually, the funny thing about that record is, like, I never listened to it growing up, ever. Like, my dad, my dad liked it, but it wasn't, I don't think he owned it. And my mom likes, like, Never Tear Us Apart, because it's, that's, like, the ballad of the song and stuff, yeah. or a ballad of the record. But uh, my buddy got a hard drive from an old radio station, like right when we got out of high school and it had like just thousands of records on it. So he let, he took it, put it on his computer, let me borrow it. And I just like, you know, pulled all the stuff off of it that I wanted. And I got a lot of stuff from my dad because it had, it had everything. Like you, I can't even begin to explain to you how much music was on this thing. Sure. And I do remember pulling in excess's kick. Cause I was like, Oh, like I like a couple of songs off that. I'm just going to take it and then I'll delete what I don't want. Went through, I ended up like burning it onto a CD and I used to go out to like the North Shore of Boston all the time. And I would do this thing where I would force myself to listen to a CD all the way through on the way out and a CD on the way back. And that just is kind of how I fell in love with that one. It's actually how I fell in love with my number one or two, but this one is because- I do of- actually. I would make myself listen to full albums. I wouldn't let myself just keep one or two tracks that annoyed the hell out of me. Yeah, Sam. Cause I, I, I mean, I, you don't even want to know the amount of CDs I still have. It's kind of gross. I have a, one of those thick books that I keep finding by accident upstairs in the office. It's all captured digitally. 
I have literally in the office, I have a full on like, like a gigantic plastic, like tote thingy. Um, it's over, over full. I'm not really sure what to do with all of them. It's pretty fucked up. Okay. It's also funny that you discovered your number two because of a radio station, because I discovered my number two because of a radio station. In college, I did college radio. Uh, Central Connecticut State had WFCS. Um, and I, because I was into hardcore, I didn't want to do like the metal shows so much because a lot of, like the way our radio station, we had it set up by blocks. So like mm -hmm. the pop punk had the afternoons where people were actually walking around the student center and hanging out. Whereas the metal guys had fucking nighttime, like eight to midnight. And you never knew who was listening to your show at that point. And it was kind of lame. You get two hour blocks. Yeah. So as the hardcore kid, I decided I would play a lot of punk at my hardcore show. And so they would let me play it in the afternoon. So I would actually get people listening. Oh, cool. Um, and then I would, so I had to start getting up these albums and I had to start collecting stuff that I could play. Um, we had a decent alternative section um, and we had a, like a growing punk scene. Like Against Me came and played our, our back room. Like, That's yeah. really cool. Yeah, that was all due to my buddy Bill Sensio, who he's a human. Anyway, so we had like this pretty decent looking collection, but all this new shit would come in and I'd be discovering it left and right. And I've constantly been trying to find bands that don't sound like every other band. And I got a pop punk album that came in, kind of punky, kind of poppy. Um, the band was called Whole Wheat Bread. And it was... Uh, three just like thugged out dudes on the front, like thugged out black guys, you know what I mean? Dressed in as black guys do. And I was like, what the hell is this album? And it was covered in swears. So the, the bill told me he wasn't going to play it on the show, but if I wanted to, I could take it home and do my own edits to it. So I said, fine, I, let me at least listen to this album. This album is so fucking cool. Like to this day, really? I love this album. It's called Whole Wheat Bread and it's called Minority Rules. It came out in like 2001, 2002. Um, three piece, black dude, punk band. Okay. Um, they have uh, Aaron Abrams is the name of the singer. And I only know his name because I met him one time. And I'll get to that story. But um, it has like a beautiful combination of like hip hop elements, but like your, your really typical punk sound, um, California, SoCal punk, kind of like skater punk stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're still making music here and there. They had this, they released an album a couple of years ago with MERS, which was fucking fantastic. It was MERS, if you don't know MERS, MERS is a hip hop artist, um, dude can spit, but it's like punk with like actual hip hop rapping on top of it. And that one's even cool. But uh, yeah, whole wheat bread. So I, at this time, I, I knew the kid that was booking shows at Webster Theater in Hartford. And every once in a while, he'd throw me like a pair of tickets. And I think they were opening for Mest or some other like really pop punk band. Yeah. I, I just, that wasn't my scene. So I go to the, I get tickets Look. to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Fred. No, no uh, it's fine. Or they're not a good band, but I, I now it's younger. They're I feel that. Wheelhouse. <laughs> so I go for whole wheat bread and then as soon as they finish I'm like I, I'm piecing out I've been to enough shows at this point they're like I don't need to see the headliner I have other yeah. shit I'm doing so I'm leaving and I see Aaron like anybody that's been to the Webster the back door was like right there so yeah. dudes would come up they would have their they would have their buses parked right next to it and dudes would just be hanging so Aaron's just hanging there out like he was smoking a cigarette or something um, and I was like, oh, dude, hi, I'm Travis. I'm, I'm a big fan. Like, I love your band. I've been playing you guys on my radio show. Like, it's like, oh, thanks, man. Thanks. We had a couple minute chat about what it was like playing music and being on tour. And he's like, oh, you're not going to go in? I'm like, nah, man, fuck that. I came here for you. He's like, shut the fuck up. And then he gave me another daps and a hug. And then that's how I ended my night with him. And it was really, really awesome. That's awesome. Knowing that I, I, that was like, I felt like I truly discovered a band where I'm sure not a lot of people know who they are still, but they're definitely worth a listen. Old Man Samson. That's probably the first song I heard that I was like, okay, all right, I can get into this. Okay. So yeah, Whole Wheat Bread. Whole Wheat Bread. Okay. I'll check. All 
All right, we've reached my number one. Are you ready? I'm excited. Okay, so this is the most like non-epic number one of all time. <laughs> so my favorite record ever. Um, Prince Purple Rain. No. My favorite record ever. I know, right? It's kind of crazy. My favorite record ever came out in 1996. It is Bringing Down the Horse by the Wallflowers. My favorite record of all time. Okay, we've totally talked about this, but what what about that album is so important to you? So like, when that record came out, I was uh, nine years old. <laughs> so the only thing I remembered was that, so that's the record, that, that's their biggest record. It had one headlight on it. It had uh, Sixth Avenue Heartache on it. It had Three Marlenas, The Difference, like those are like their bigger singles. But just, I just I never bought it. I never had never bought that record ever as a kid. Didn't really care. I liked One Headlight, but like everybody did. Right. I was also not, and so I was like, "Oh, that song's catchy." You're like hell yeah. So then as I got older, I found out that like Bob Dylan's kid is like the lead singer, and I thought that was cool. But I don't I don't really care. Like I don't really care that much about Bob Dylan. He doesn't like really do it for me. Uh, he I discovered Bob Dylan in my 20s and I learned a lot about him from a biography and that's yeah. when I learned to appreciate Dylan but uh, I appreciate Dylan and I, I do like his stuff I just like he does a, a lot of those like guys don't really do that I don't like lose my mind over him and I don't really lose my mind over the fact that this kid was in this band like it didn't matter to me right. but I thought it was cool um and then probably I was like 20 22-ish, 21, 22, probably 22-ish. And my grandma, I'll never forget this. My grandma went to like a yard sale and bought an entire like stand-up CD rack that was like full of CDs off of somebody that I'm pretty sure was like a 17-year-old girl in the year, you know, 1998. Because the whole thing was like, it was like Britney Spears' first two records. Uh, Mandy Moore's first record, like the first two in sync records, like, it was like all that, like very much a teenage girl's record collection in the very late nineties. But this Wallflowers record was in there. It was a CD, CD. So my grandma was like, "Hey, like you can have whatever you want in this." I'm like, first of all, why do you have any of these at all? It made no sense." So she was like, "Oh, it was like five bucks for all of them." Oh, that's pretty cool. So I took, I took, I think I even took the whole thing to be honest with you, because every one of those records, like even like that first Britney record, like they've got some sick songs on them. And I'm like, it's cool to like have these in my collection. I'm not going to go buy a Britney Spears CD, but like, it's cool to have it. So I, brought, I took a whole bunch of them home and that Wallflowers record was in there. And I was like, oh, cool. Like I like, you know, two of those songs that I know really, really, really well from when I was a little kid, but that's all I knew. So, and I knew they did a cover of Bowie's Heroes for that first Godzilla movie, but that's not on that record. It came out in between. So, <laughs> so took this stuff home, probably didn't listen to it for like a year. And then one day I was like driving out to, out to Lynn and I brought a couple CDs with me and I was still in that, like, I'm going to force myself to listen to this stuff. And if I don't like it, I will probably just get rid of it because I don't need all of these this was one of the ones I brought with me and it, I literally listened to it nonstop for like eight months. It's the only thing I listened to. Every single song on that record is probably the, the best lyric, lyrically written song I've ever heard in my entire life. I think the music to it is amazing. They're a rock and roll band in like the truest sense. There's country influence on there. There's blues influence on there. It, it, they're just, they're the, it's a perfect rock and roll record there's pop influence on there obviously um the only thing i don't like is they kind of went like the like like rock song slow song rock song slow song but the slow songs are like unbelievably good but if, if i could change anything it would be that i don't like that it's very like cookie cutter you would rethink lame. the track listings yeah that's it though um t-bone Burnett produced it who's like one of the best producers of all time it's just like everything about that record is so perfect. Uh, and then I kind of fell in love with that band. And then I'm going to listen to their other records and I don't like them. <laughs> yeah. I just don't, yeah, because it, I think this record was so like, 
it's perfect. And it, they weren't a band. Like, no, I don't, nobody knew who Jacob Dylan was before one headlight. Like, they got really lucky. So also their first record came out in 1989. And then their second record came out in 1996. Like, they never did anything. They, sure. I think when they first came out, people thought that, you know, they're going to have he, – I think he kind of banked off the fact that his dad was Bob Dylan and was probably going to coast on that. And it didn't happen. For, and they didn't put out another record for almost 10 years. And then they put out their best record, and it was massive. They won Grammys on it and stuff. Like, it's just – it's insane how good that record is. Then they didn't do anything for a couple of years. And what, what they did after, I just never really got in. I, I'm not a huge Jacob Dylan fan. I think he is way too full of himself. Not my jam at all. But, um, okay. but yeah, that record's been my favorite record since the minute I listened to the entire thing. I'm obsessed with it. I bought, I have it on, I think I have two versions of it on CD. I have the vinyl, which they just re, they released the vinyl, like I think either last year or the year before. What year is right now? 2020? <laughs> maybe it came out. It might, <laughs> it might have came out in 2000. Maybe it was like. What year is it? I forgot what year it was. It might have been 90. So it must have been 2016 that they released the vinyl for the 20th anniversary of it. Um, so yeah, I have that. I have the cassette, which is still in like the plastic wrap. Like it was never open. I bought it on eBay for like 10 bucks or something. Okay. Legit. Um, but yeah, I've never, never seen that band live. I just love that record. It's my favorite record ever. Some of the best lyrics I've ever heard in my entire life. Every time I listen to it, I find a new section of a song. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get that tattooed on me right now. Still haven't, but I will someday. I love those albums that as you grow and listen to them and reapproach them, again, just your understanding of the world has changed. So different parts. Yeah. And that's the shit that's cool. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that record, every time I put it on, I think it gets better, which is insane because it came out 24 years ago. Like, but yeah, it's just so, so good sounds good the drums are like unbelievably good they're simple but they're good like he just had the best musicians in that band <laughs> it was so awesome i feel similarly about not about wallflowers i mean they're fine i don't th i'm the only person in the world that feels that way with the wallflowers like anytime i tell anybody that that's my favorite record they're like what the fuck like because most people first of all have no idea who they are and then they know one headlight as like the like cinderella song and that's it but I'm like, dude, you gotta, like, oh my God, that record is so fun. So, yeah. Um, well, my number one is my all-time favorite record, too. Um, and I, I don't have as much of a, a crazy story like that. But I actually didn't like this band. And I hated on this album for years before I got it. Um, my, again, I think I've brought him up a couple times already. Matt Rockwell, who's like one of my best friends in the entire world. I met him in college and we're very similar. Um, he has a much more open, or especially then, a much more open sense to music. Um, and he would play this band. Then anytime they play in our dorm room, it would just sound like somebody was, was strangling a cat. And the music was all just like all over the place. And it was loud. And like, I liked heavy music, but this was just, it, did, it didn't have a, a, like a, a nice rhythm to it. And then somebody, somebody somewhere, I don't know, I was playing a show somewhere, probably talking to somebody after the show. And the, the band is Converge. And um, they, the, talking to this person, and they told me, I said I was complaining about how I didn't like it, how it was all over the place. And they told me that I had to stop listening to it as a metal band and start listening to it as a jazz band. And like, once I kind of made that parallel, like, okay, this is just really, really heavy jazz music. Um, I found myself, again, we're in college. This is, the, the album came out in 2001. The album's Jane Doe, which is quintessentially their, one of their best albums, one of the top metal albums ever. Um, produced fucking insane Kurt did an amazing job the drums and like what they had to do to record just like the catches and like Kurt's playing guitar uh Ben Collar's playing drums and Ben is trying to catch two cymbals while Kurt's catching another cymbal also they can get all this stuff super tight um I guess I, I was in a dark place and and Homewrecker came on and for whatever reason, like junior or college, it just, it like somebody went click yeah. and everything made sense. 
And then I started listening to that album front to back over and over again. And No Love, No Hope is, is still one of my favorite little collection of words because it just, it hits with me. And that album, the artwork, Jacob Bannon's artwork is eye-catching and stunning. And I'm, I would argue that 90% of the people that listen to our show have seen this artwork. It's of a, of a woman's face. You may not know Converge, but like much like the, the Misfits um, Crimson Skull, this Converge Jane Doe face has been plastered everywhere. And it's like it's, a lot of metal dudes have this T-shirt. That album is just so insanely fucking good. Um, it's all over the place. It slows down. It sounds like it's about hate and like angry shit, but it's really Jacob Bannon writing love songs. And like, it's insane. It's insanely good. And huh. I hated it when, it first, when I first found out about it and now he's easily my favorite album of all time. Really? I can be in any mood. I can be sad. I can be mad. I can be just chill. I don't know what it is about that album. It just, it hits a sweet spot in me that I just, I love. It's guttural, it's hard, it's percussive, but it's also like heartfelt and intricate and- Yeah. Weird. Yeah, I love it. I yeah. fucking love it. I've never, that music is not in my wheelhouse. Like I like, I, and I'm sure I like, I like it. I do like heavy music here and there, but it's like very much here and there. Sure. Um, I saw Converge play the first year I went to Boston Calling. They got added when Modern Baseball dropped. And it was cool. And a lot of people went nuts. And it was fun to see them. But, like, it wasn't – they just – they're not a band that does it for me. Adam, I like seeing – A lot of that music also doesn't really do it for me. But Oh, a lot of – I mean, it does now. I don't like seeing Converge in a big room. Um, I've seen sure. them a couple times. And the tighter the room, the better the set. Okay. They're not a big room band. If you, yeah. if you had a fucking chance to see them in a basement, that's the best place to see them because okay. their, their music is really tight. And a lot of those, those like stadium shows, the way they'll get over it is they'll crank up the volume and everything. So yeah. you'll get that, that echo off the back wall. That echo off the back wall fucks with you more than with their music, especially because again, it's just going to muddy it. Yeah. Um, we've kind that's of gone long on this episode you want to instead of go stokes and pokes just do our our honorable mentions and then yeah that works to me all right um you want me to go first do you want me yeah. first? all right do it up. so what do it up okay so i'm just gonna go through them like really quickly um so my first honorable mention is bc boys paul's boutique probably this Honestly, it's probably like the fourth BC Boys record I ever listened to. I didn't, it's their second one. It's easily their best one, in my opinion. Sure. Um, but it's, it wasn't one that I got into right away. It only had, I think, like one single that was on the radio. I know way more about it now than I did before. And before I loved it, now I'm, I'm completely obsessed with it. It's one of the best records ever. It was really hard for me not to put that in my top five. Um, so yeah, BC Boys, Paul's Boutique. My second one is The Get Up Kids, Something to Write Home About. I remember every older kid and by older, I mean like only a couple years older than me had that CD. I saw that, that record cover. I saw it everywhere ever. And I mean, growing up that band, it was like them and saves the day were kind of like the Beatles and Rolling Stones of, of, you know, late nineties, early two thousands emo, like every band. Well, everybody loved those two bands. They're the best. Um, and this is just one of the best records ever. It's not even my favorite get up kids record. My favorite Get Up Kids record is uh, Guilt Show. Okay. But Something Right Home About is just, it's perfect. Like, that's another record that if I'm ever in a, no matter what mood I'm in, I can put it on and it just changes everything for me. I love that record. And then uh, probably the hardest record for me to not put in my top five is easily my favorite Green Day record, Warning. Warning was my favorite Green Day record. It's the one Green Day record that doesn't sound like them. It came out in 2001. It's very, like, there's a lot of acoustic on it. There's not, there's really no, like, fast punk songs. It's a very, like, adult record for them. It's, a, it's, it's like their adult record. I know what you're saying. Um, there's a lot of famous stories about when they were on Warped Tour, because that was the one year they did Warped Tour, was 2001, I think, or 2000. 
2000, 2001, but they did it. No effects was on that, that tour. And Fat Mike did an interview saying how like, you know, Green Day put us a new record and he's like, dude, like I love Green Day. But, like that record's fucking trash. So many people hate that record outside of Minority, which was the only big song off of it. Um, but I think that's one of the best records of all time. It's just, it's so, so good. Lyrically, it's great. Musically, it's the best. It just sounds like, they sound like a rock band. Like, they're not a punk band on that record. They're just a rock and roll band. There's a lot of acoustic. Even on songs that have electric guitar, there's acoustic on everything. Um, it's incredible. I love that record. That was the hardest one to not play my top five. Respect. Um, I definitely own that one. I owned Insomniac. Did you ever listen to Foxborough Hot Tub? Loved that record. That, that was so sick. If anybody's a fan of Green Day and they're also a fan of Garage Rock, look up the band Foxborough Hot Tub because they only had one release, but it was funky. It's so I that record is unbelievably good. It's it's I forget about it and then I rediscover. I'm like, oh yeah, this is Green Day, huh? I forgot yeah. about that too. That's like oh my god that yeah i'm actually probably gonna put that on after we hang up <laughs> that record is unbelievably good you can hate green day and still love that record you don't yeah you don't have to like green day no. yeah especially if you were into like the strokes or like the shit that was coming out around that time yeah but uh my honorable mentions wu-tang clan the swarm i can remember when killer bees came out the music video for killer bees came out and i wasn't really into hip-hop at that point but that video is just so it's a movie, man. Yeah, it's insane. And then I started, I watched it too many times and I'm like, I can now start singing some of the words. And then all of a sudden that really opened me up to like what the Wu-Tang Clan was. Yeah. So that album, I owned it in college. I didn't own it until then, but it's a good album. Yeah. Um, Planet Smashers, Life of the Party. Planet Smashers is a, a ska band? band. Yeah. In I'm in Canada. <laughs> I almost put Catch-22 on my Kesby Nights or Kesby Nights or whatever. Yeah, I uh, that. But that Planet Smashers album, I was in a dark point in college and I was just in like a bad time and I was feeling sad and break up and some bullshit. Yeah. Um, and a good friend that is no longer with us, my friend Mike, gave me, he's like, yo, quit being a pussy, listen to this and start smiling again or something to those words which he, this kid was such, he was like this scrawny little kid with this big poofy hair and he'd always wear a pocket cap. Mike was, uh, he was his own person. I love him. I miss him. But uh, he gave me that album. And to this day, if I'm ever like in a real sad spot and I just, it's the album I listen to after people pass away. If I'm yeah. being hundred percent honest, it is just, there's something about it that always picks me right up and it makes me think of Mike and it makes me think of happier times. And it's, it was hard not to put on my list. Yeah. Cause structurally it's not even that good of an album. It's just what really? it is for me. Um, but structurally an album that is fantastic. And my number third, my number third, my number three would be a Wilhelm scream. New print um, came out in college. Again, this is right around the same time where I was moving from hardcore and punk back and forth. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Dog. <laughs> Wilhelm Scream, Mute Print, came out in college, um, 2001, 2002. Can you hear him? Is he going? Yeah, it's fine. It's part of the... So annoying. The and I have the other one right here coming up on. I can remember working a night job. I was working second shift at Walmart at the time, and I would blast that, that album on my right home. It'd be midnight, and I'd be dead tired. And Mute Print, like, it got me home safely every night uh from the first track to like it's it's real fast i think it's 40 minutes front to back oh wow. um, it was a 20 minute ride so i'd listen to the first half on the ride to work and the, the second half on the ride home and like it got to the point where i listened to it every single night and every single day and i knew how i was doing on time because i'd have to hit certain points by like by track three i should be at this point on route eight in connecticut so <laughs> um it was a solid album that's awesome what a weird way to end this thing. This has been fun. No Stokes and Pokes, but I uh, hope you guys maybe found an album that you hadn't heard about before. I know I'm going to go listen to some, potentially some Maroon 5 or some Wallflower yeah. after this. Get ready. Get ready. I'm going to send <laughs> some Aesop Rock and hopefully open up his eyes. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, 
Well, that's it, folks. You did it. You made it through another whatever this is. And uh, we love you so much for it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Party on. Give this video alert podcast or whatever a like so you could give us a subscribe maybe suggest us to a friend i don't know check out our website yeah seltzer time check out our tiktok check out our twitter account we got instagram we got facebook son we got we got everything son but uh until then i have been travis you can find me on the interwebs at hunchback travis i have been ricky you can find me at dick chuck 77 seltzer time official Probably going to be hosting MTV's TRL when we bring it back, son. Yeah, we are the new Carson Daly. <laughs> we got TikTok. We got we got Tumblr accounts. I don't know if it's Tumblr account. I don't think anybody does. Oh, my God. I remember when they were trying to get, like, the next VJ, and they were all interviewing Method Man. And Method Man had a toothbrush, and everybody just He's kept asking about the toothbrush. He's and the he's with his look. Anyway, all Shout right. Out, won that competition. Jesse. I love that, dude. Awesome, guys. See you next week. Bye, guys. Sorry for partying.